Then the meat, then the vegetables. Wait, bring all my food at one time on the same plate. Dixieland, bebop, soul, rhythm and blues, cool school, swing, avant garde, jazz, free jazz, rock. What kind of music you play? The good kind. Aretha Franklin and Sunrise, the same folks. Cold Train, Dixie Hummingbirds, the same. Miles, Muddy Waters, the same. There is no, there is no. Labels divide, separate. One music, different feelings and experiences, but same. Total sound, mass sound. Hear all the players as one. The history of Africa was memorized, lived, experienced, now. We didn't read it, we did it. Oral, literary, oral, do, improvise, adjust, create, literary, catalog, label, divide, read, interpret, criticize. No separation. Yeah, don't put me in no bag. I'm open. May do anything. Put all my food on the same place. African concept of color. If it has light, it's yellow. No subtleties. He must be colorblind. No way, right, Picasso? Read the music, play the music, create the music, read the music, play the music, create the music. Can you read music? No, it's best just to create it and play it. That's more direct. Eh, 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 eh. <laughs> 
Where you is, is where you at. Anna Hingleberg of Old Tampa Bay, Devil Rays, Florida Waves, Blue Wave Beaches, Endless Flowers, Floridians, Indians, History. How fast does the river flow? A sea breeze blowing through wispy willow branches, moss hanging from ancient trees, turtles dying, drying, and readying to re-enter warm, wet, humid sunsets of the land. State of mixed colors and people, sifted from land through time, all with their own stories. Stories that stir the wind. Is the air so thick with moisture that you can breathe in the colors you see? Influenced by the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, Apalachicola River to the width of Lacuchi, Oki Fanoki Swamp to Lake Oki Chobi, Apaca, Tosala, Istopaga, Kalasahatchee River, Crescent, George, Monroe, Chattahoochee, rolling hills dotted by thousands of lakes, burial grounds of Indians, seven mounds, Tumacuan tribes, St. John's peoples, Tocaboga Indians, Apalachee Indians, Texcueta Indians, Calusa Indians, Meshobian tribes, Creek people, Yomasi Indians, Chiaha, Okone, Sawokale, Apalachicola, and Mikasuki, burial mounds filled with <coughs> copper, stone, burial mounds filled with. Uh. Thank <laughs> you. 
You look marvelous. You look marvelous. Who are you wearing? I'm wearing Amiri Baraka, nice. ultimate soul brother. He was always there for you. You look marvelous. Who are you wearing? I'm wearing blues people and the Dutchman, always flat at the third and the seventh with the blues people. In the scale of things, he was always making you laugh. He was always, he was always, you look marvelous. Who are you wearing? I'm wearing Baraka. It's stunning, serious, gorgeous, straightforward to the point, clean lines, poured laureate light. You look marvelous. Who are you wearing? I'm wearing Amiri, who always stood his ground. Even though small in stature, he was a giant, spreading his words. He was always, he was always. You look <coughs> marvelous. Who are you wearing? Revolutionary word poems by Black Arts Movement. And he's doing the jitterbug. Amiri, the smooth operator, every day. Very smart, very funny, very kind. to break glass. I say, what you doing? She breaking glass. She say, 
We get 25 cents for every bushel basket of glass, so pick up all them empties and put them in the basket. Why is she breaking glass? She owns the Five Sisters restaurant with her four sisters. She owns the pool room next door to the Five Sisters and the car wash right next door to the pool room. And she owns my three chair shoe shine parlor that my stepfather built for me, which is next door to the car wash. And she owns the house, which is next door to the shoe shine parlor. Why is she breaking glass? Man, that was the property from the corner to the middle of the block. I didn't want to pick up no empty bottles, but she did. Every time I heard, ching, 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 it was my mama breaking glass with a hammer. She had a hammer early Sunday morning. Ching, ching, ching. That's the morning after the Saturday all night crap game that my dad ran. He was a house man, got his cut on every play. And I smell the hickory smoke late every Saturday night because every Sunday my mama sold barbecue dinners right out of the house. She had all that. And she still, she broke glass at 25 cent a bushel basket. She racked balls in the pool room, cooked pig ear sandwiches in the restaurant, and gave me anything I asked for. I'm much older now, and my mom has passed on over the white stone. Now, I'm breaking glass. playing saxophone, but I was right. totally intrigued with him as a teenager when I was started listening to his music. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the musicians around me that I was growing up were my heroes. I'm sitting next to one right now who was, a, who was an inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jackie McLean, uh, Eric Dolphy, those are two of the main influences in terms of how I think I'm shaping what I do and making my sound. But I copied a little bit of Eric, a little bit of yeah. Jackie, and try to synthesize that yeah. what you just heard today. No, it was definitely amazing. I heard, <laughs> I heard them inner valley lips, I was like, <laughs> you know, just definitely not the kind of like, you know, linear kind of thing, very angular, you know, I really enjoyed that. So those are some of the musicians, uh, Duke Ellington, <clears throat> and from, and in terms of composing and it was one thing about Duke Ellington. Every time I, as a composer, usually having him as an inspiration, every time I compose something, I find out that Duke Ellington has already composed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Your influences? Would you like to share? A lot of people. I mean, uh, same boat, deep breath, and we are. It's all and all. Sunrise. I don't really, uh, there's a lot of folks, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, any, any questions? Anybody have any questions? We'll just do like a back and forth kind of thing, that's most. All right, um, so what was like the political, social climate that shaped your music? Like what, what informed this sound, this music? Well, we started the Black Artist Group around 1968, mm -hmm. and we were, inspired by the AACM out of Chicago, the Association for Advanced and Creative Musicians. We were uh, around 1966, 67, 68, maybe 67 and 68. We were having jam sessions all the time in St. Louis, yeah. where Blue was there. And, um, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, uh, Akita Carroll, Bobo Shaw, uh, other players who were from St. Louis at that time. And I made a trip to Chicago and met the AACM. Uh, of course, Julius Hemphill was in St. Louis as well. And we were having these informal jam sessions that we did. And I made this trip to Chicago and met the art ensemble. And Lester had been in St. Louis and later on moved to Chicago. 
and was a part of the ACM. And then when I came back from seeing the ACM, which, which was a group that was formally organized as an organization, right. and giving, the, presenting themselves and teaching classes and to the average students, I came back and proposed to our group, which was getting together informally. We were getting together informally at having a jam session be in the park every day, pretty much five, six days a week we would get together and have jam sessions. I said, so why don't we become a branch of the AACM in St. Louis? And Judas Hinkle said, no, why don't we just form our own group because we now have an association with dancers, actors, poets, and musicians. We were at that time involved doing a play at one of the schools at Forest Park University, and it was a, a play called Genet, by the, I mean by, called Blacks by Genet. And so we had this association with actors, and we, and we were the musicians in that play. So we took the core of that group and started the Black Artist Group. Wow. And that was the time of uh, so-called Black Power. Right. And there was a lot of self-determination which was going on across the United States by uh, Black Arts groups that were starting on the West Coast and the Midwest and in New York, of course. And we felt that to define our future, we would present ourselves. And that was part of the inspiration of, of what got me into doing everything that I do. Was the, the, work that I, the work that we were doing in the Black Artist Group was a school for me, even though it, that was a school, but it was a school for the people who were running that school as well. Because a, a typical week or month for me would be to accompany a poet one weekend, and we presented ourselves every weekend. We had our own building. We were able to get funding in the first year that we started, which was incredible. And we were able to, uh, so I would accompany a poet one week. I would write music for a play the next week. I, uh, Lloyd had the big band there. I would write for big band. Lloyd was writing for big band. Um, there were dancers that were part of the group. And then I would accompany the dancers the next week. So it was a full multimedia. Uh, so after moving to New York, I continued to do everything that I did in the Black Arts Group. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that. So now, I, the last 10 or 12 years, I've been painting very, very sporadically, I should say. <laughs> but but, but uh, this is a house called the Jazz House, which is in Pittsburgh, which is a, a design of mine. I'll pass it around. And this is the other side of it. And, and I have a book of poetry that I do with my paintings and that. So I'm doing poetry as you heard me. And were you doing poetry at the time of the, when you started? No, when I started the black when we started in the black artist group, I was accompanying the poets and that inspired me to start writing my own poetry. And when I moved to New York, I hooked up with Nishizaka Shange and Mary Baraka, and Quincy Troop, and other guy, other poets that I accompanied. And then I started writing my own poetry and presenting it in my as part of my. So, you, would you say that everybody in the in the organization was pretty open, like the poets and everybody was just it was very. Well, you know, it's kind of like what I said a minute ago. There's no separation in what we do. Right. It's all one thing. That was part of the philosophy of the Black Artist Group, and it ended up being my philosophy that I was open to all forms of, and the same thing with arts for arts, it's the same concept. I don't know, Blue, if you want to speak a little bit about the Black Artist Group. Well, you did a good job. <laughs> but you know, in terms of the Black Artist Group, too, there was a book that was written about, I guess it's been about five years ago, by uh, Ben Looker. And it's called Point From Which Creation Begins. And he interviewed the, the majority of us who were a part, who started the Black Artist Group at that particular time and wrote this book. And it's very interesting. He did a very good job. And it's very pretty accurate for recovering that history of that time. Because the group only lasted about four years, from 1968 to 1972. But it was so important and there was so much going on in St. Louis at that particular time with that group that it was historical. Would you like to pass it? Pass it? Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you go on Amazon, uh, Ben Looker, Black Artist Group, Point from which the creation begins, you can 
get that and get the history of the group at that particular what happened at that particular There's only the one recording from Paris, right? From like 72? I mean, right. it seems like it, it's interesting to me that the self-determination, like all that stuff was happening, but was there a reason? Was it the, was there like technical reason or money that the recordings weren't happening? Like right now, everything's about people, anybody can record anything, right? So there's like, <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of recording, but a lot of it wasn't released. Mm. So, I mean, we recorded almost every weekend when we performed in, in our building that we recorded. But there were a couple of albums that came out. Uh, Point from which Creation Begins was one and was the name of the recording that we did. And then Bag in Paris yeah, that's, was, uh, was, came out in 1972 because we, we moved in Paris. We moved, five of us moved to Paris when the group kind of dissolved. And I think I changed the name of, to that group to Oliver Lake Bag, the musicians that went to Paris. And that was one recording, but we had recorded one before that, before we left St. Louis as a group. Like independent label or something like that? It was a local label in St. Louis. I'm not remember the name of that label now. Have any of the other recordings survived? Sure. Yeah. Uh, some of them were. Some there was a, a collaboration with a group called. Uh, oh boy, my memory is gone. Oh, what was uh, Jim Marshall's group? Uh, remember the name of his group? It involved a lot of the black artists and musicians, but he did some record, did some recordings too. But I can't remember exactly the name of the label that it was on. When you look out today, do you see anything that resonates with the spirit of that time? Uh, yeah, I mean the music is alive and well. <laughs> I mean, and, and it, everything is moving along in a very positive way from my perspective, but. Also, I think the lesson learned for me was that I have to do it myself, you know, that I have to be resourceful and create situations. And I, I think a lot of the young musicians realize that same thing as well in order to make things happen. Now, a lot of musicians have their own record label. Um, that's a way of making things happen yourself because you can't wait for someone to record you or record yourself and get it out. I have my own independent label for the, over the last 20 years called Passing Through. And I've released uh, 20 out CDs or 20 albums on that label. My big band, my last uh, recording on there was my big band CD uh, last year. <clears throat> So what was the reason the group only lasted four years? Well, there were some internal squabbles that happened. <laughs> I mean, we had uh, the dance department, the, 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 the uh, musicians, the poets, and the actors. And there was uh, some tension between the actors and the musicians, and it just ended up dissolving the group. Without going into any kind of yeah. any details, that was, a, in a nutshell, that's what happened. And then. At that particular time, five of us um, musicians moved to Paris and kept the name Bag. And I called it, I mentioned before, I called the group the Black uh, Oliver Lake Bag when they moved to Paris. And so, how was the organization funded? Like, how were you? you there was an organization there called the Danforth Foundation. And all this is, is in this book here, uh, uh, Bag, the book that was done by Ben Looker. But there's an organization there called Danforth Foundation. And uh, Catherine Dunham, I don't know how many of you have heard of Catherine Dunham. Yeah. Her group was in East St. Louis, and we were in St. Louis, and we ended up being kind of partners through the Danforth Foundation. They funded both groups at the same time because we were the only group in St. Louis at that particular time that were doing what we were doing that had all the multi arts under one umbrella and presenting ourselves and doing theater, dance, poetry, and music, and doing it in a very creative way. And being re re relevant in terms of what was going on politically, because again, I say that was a time that was called, politically it was called black power at that particular time of, of, of the historical time span. It was the black power movement was going on at the time. And we were relevant in that way, and so was Catherine Dunham. She had a very 
African-based uh, group in East St. Louis, and we were able to receive funding. When we received funding, we got a building, and we started a school, and we did a, had a performance space in that same building, and we did our, presented ourselves on a weekly basis. Does anything go on in that building anymore? No, that building has been uh, boarded up for I don't know how many years. I, I was in St. Louis last year and drove by there and saw that it is an empty space. Mm -hmm. Were you um, conscious that, I mean, not conscious, but <coughs> was the music as a collective an extension, a uh, way that you extended into the world to make a statement politically against something specific? Was there, um, was it, uh, did you consider Well, I, I don't think we consciously thought about the music making a, any kind of political statement. We had a theater department that took care of that completely. <laughs> so that was, if we were on stage with that theater department playing music while that they were doing what they were doing, it was obvious that it was very political. So I never, as a musician, I never thought of making a political statement. I know at that, that particular time, and I'm probably after that, some of the writers thought that the music that was being made was, was very angry and you were but I mean, everything that I was involved in was coming out of love. You know, it wasn't about any anger or anything. You know, even though it made people interpret the sounds that we were making on our instruments in that way, but that was the furthest thing away from me. It was all about exchanging energy, giving out my energy, and receiving the energy from you, and coming back and trying to make the world a better place. So you mentioned, um in, in your poetry um, that labels divide. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's been my experience going to different institutions like Howard. Just in my experience overall that a lot of these labels are, uh, are taught in school. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is your, what is your take on that? You know, the separation of this is this versus this is this and this is valid, this is invalid. Well, that keeps us away from a lot of the music, from enjoying a lot of the music. I mean, you know, you have the bebop musicians against the rap musicians, and the rap musicians against the bebop musicians, and, and you know, it goes right, on right, and on. Right. And, 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 and uh, what happens is, that's why I say, what kind of music do you play? The good kind. So, so you don't really get caught up in these different labels. Mm. I mean, if you had told somebody I'm going to hear Oliver Lake tonight, they'd say, oh, I don't listen to the avant-garde. And well, what is avant-garde? But maybe if that, that might have said, said, I don't listen to that. So that label stopped them from coming. Right. And, but if you say, I'm going to hear some music, come. And if you got an open mind, I'm ready to see what happens. So the labels have a way of blocking us off from different things. But I mean, a lot of us are smart enough to realize that. And, you know, listen to everything because it's very, everything is a, a big pot now. It's being mixed over and over. There was a, a time in the 80s I had a group called Oliver Rick Jump Up, and I had synthesized uh, reggae with jazz. Mm. And at that particular time, that was a new uh, mixture. <laughs> so if you want to hear some of that, you could probably go on YouTube or and, and put a Oliver Lake jump up and hear some of the stuff that we did in the early 80s. So, so all those labels, are, I'm open to everything. No, I agree. <laughs> no, I think a lot of young people are too. I think so too. But I think that when you go to these institutions um, and they're only taught a certain part of history, uh, like the Duke Ellington's and the Thad Jones, which is all great music, mm -hmm. but then not talked about other parts that was going on in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of feel like, wow, okay, is, is this it? But then well, when they, it, when they you know. did that jazz documentary, uh, Ken Burns, they, mm -hmm. they left us mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, the, where, where was the World Saxophone Quartet? Right. And we, historically, we, were, we are one of, were, were, are one of the most important groups mm -hmm. in the history of the nation. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would you talk a little bit about how um, you've been impacted by the way music gets delivered to people, how people streaming and Spotify and Pandora and vis-a-vis and how, how you get paid?
paid? You know, how you get the music to people and now you get paid in return? Well, that's, that's changing and changed and it's continuing to change. Now CDs are almost like coasters for you to put, on your, put your drink on. Everybody makes a CD and it has less and less importance and you make less and less money from, from that. I find that the, one of the reasons I started my own label was so I could have control of the music that I make and record. Uh, and one example of that is hearing John Coltrane's music in a Cherokee commercial on TV. Oh, yeah. mm. So when he made that music, or, or Lee Morgan's music in one of those car commercials, when they made that music, and, and, and I don't know how much they, control they had of owning the publishing, they still had no idea that when they were recording that this is one day going to be on TV in a commercial. So realizing that, I felt it was important for me to own my publishing, to own my label. It doesn't stop me from recording with other labels, but I still make sure that I own the publishing for that so that I can get a few pennies that are due to me. I can at least receive that. But in terms of how the music is being disseminated now, it's almost like you got to throw your hands up because people can get it. At, at, I mean, when you walk in, everybody's got a recording studio in their pocket. Mm -hmm. So they can, re they can record you, they can, they can download you illegally, everything. So we just have to um, be as creative as we can and see where it ends up because it's not over. It's still evolving as we speak. So the flip side of that, there, Oliver Lake fans in China now, what about the ability to reach people you couldn't have dreamed of? Right, so there are a lot of positive things about the internet as well, but there's some negative things too, but I think as a musician and as a creative person, just being aware of it and trying to make it work to our advantage. Look, you want to speak with me? <laughs> <laughs> First off, thank you for being here um, as a fellow Jerseyite. Um, and also, what influence do you think um, Mary Baraka has on jazz music? Um, and secondly, what what do you think is the connection point between Mary Baraka and Sun Ra? Do they have what what? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, they're a continuum, you know, it's one single line. Uh -huh. And when I think about Amir Baraka, I, the very last thing that I said in the poem that I dedicated to him, he was very kind and very smart. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we were friends from the time I moved to New York in 1974 mm -hmm. up until he passed and he attended, all, whenever he could, he was at every concert I did, at every concert Blue did, at every concert that Craig Harris did, at every con I mean, he was all over the place. And he was a real lover of the music. So every, all of that energy, that positive energy that he was giving, aside from the creative, the, the book, the blues people, and the, his poetry <laughs> and his plays, I, I don't know how to phrase it anymore for, for that. I mean, just in terms of inspiration. I like this pipe in there, just, just to sort of, I mean, to me, Amiri Baraka is a truth teller. And to me, this music is primarily about telling the truth. Although it's not a, it's not a verbal truth, but it's like, it's really, when you improvise in this kind of way, that's what you're doing. You're, you're not bullshitting, you're telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And then that's the commonality. And it's one of the, it's an important commonality, that and the culture itself. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you play and when you improvise, you expose yourself, you're just open. Mm -hmm. And you're giving that energy out and it's coming back to you. <coughs> and it's, uh, it's a very positive experience. But, I mean, it's not based on a, whether you transition properly from the B flat to the A flat. <laughs> it's just about giving out yeah. the energy. And being very spontaneous and 
moving that music that you have within you forward and sharing that with with, with the with the audience. And the audience shares also. It comes back to the to the artist. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the idea of arts collectives, right? I mean, there was like the push in the '60s, and then like in. I was a little outraged last week. They talked, the New York Times ran a piece on Brooklyn, like Brooklyn branding. And it was about this house that they put forward as an arts collective, but not with hippies. And it was all these musicians, all white, all 20 something living together in a house in Brooklyn. And that's the way to make it in the business, they said. And they all had their own brand and they were about to do an ad for like a, you know, and I'm interested in collectives and I'm interested in, in cooperatives and like, well, that's one of the reasons that I work with Arts for Art, because Arts for Art is, is about supporting the artists, right? I'm just wondering if you have any take on that. Like, the, the experiments that you guys did, I don't know how they get carried forward. Well, maybe the description you just gave is how it gets carried forward, because those guys are living together and they're branding themselves. We didn't do that. It's all for profit. Uh -huh. I mean, they're talking about themselves as corporate, right? Like, like, we all have to become little corporations in order for the arts to work. They're actually financed by venture capitalists. Right? Yeah, yeah, oh. they're, they're selling parts of themselves to venture capitalists. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's new to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm non for profit. <laughs> I'm with the profit. <laughs> Well, you know, the National Football League is not for profit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't mean you don't make money. Or pay taxes. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, more. Oh, one more question. Yes. Uh, I recall both of you mentioned uh, Sun Ra. So I'm just, I'm just wondering about your, your, your relationship with Sun Ra and uh, how his music affects you. I never had the opportunity to play with Sun Ra. I don't know if you would have played with him. I never had the opportunity to play with him. I just remember what he said. He can call me Mr. Reed, you can call me Mr. Ra, you can call me Mr. Mr. Reed. <laughs> and I said, that's Sun Ra. But I've always listened to his music, and I've known a lot of musicians in his group, but, you know, inspirational figure in the music. Any other questions? Um, yes. Uh, so I'm part of the group that is creating these salons and one of the things, one of, we all individually had our own reasons for wanting to bring this forward <coughs> and one of the things that I keep bringing up at each salon is trying to also have the audience leave and have that exchange with their beautiful music, which I'm so thankful for, of kind of, I see you all as these incredible, rare flowers, and really, like, I'm so grateful to um, have the opportunity to share in your music and to learn. And I, I'm concerned about, personally, about how these lineages passed on, and uh, I'm concerned about how um, the relationship of mentor and learning from human being to human <coughs> being and having that exchange that is not happening as much anymore because a lot of people are learning music and dance through institutions mm -hmm. and not from an experiential um, growth. And so I, I, I want to, uh, I'm not sure exactly what my question is, but I want to continue to cultivate within this community the thoughts about what is needed to continue to uh, support more of these flowers and beautiful musicians and dancers to develop and have the support they need. And, um, and I was, one of the, maybe more specifically, is I kind of wonder what is it You know, what is it exactly do we need to listen to within our own selves to keep ourselves creative? You know, what is, what are the, are there signs that you have to pay attention to, to, um, 
be like, okay, I'm not going to ignore that. Let me not polish that too much. Let me leave that one rugged. Let me, how do I, how do I maintain an original architecture of myself so that I can really continue a movement that was about originality, creativity, and so that means for myself, I have to cultivate that. So I want to be a part of continuing what you've done. I want to be um, making you... Um, well, if you're talking about cultivating what you do, I think you have to, to have some discipline and do it every day. Mm -hmm. And even if it's just for a short period, if you can... I mean, I had a friend uh, who inspired me, um, uh, a saxophonist who was a visual artist. Uh, I'm going to think of his name in a minute. <laughs> but uh, he, when, when I was uh, de deciding that I wanted to spend some time painting, I said, I don't have any time to paint, I, but I love to do it. I did it when I was in high school and growing up, and I didn't have any time to do that. Douglas Ewing, who, who inspired me, it's because he's a visual artist and he's a saxophonist. And I said, Douglas, I really want to spend some time painting, but I don't have any time. I'm traveling, I'm composing, I'm practicing my instrument, I don't have time to paint. And he looked at me and he said, do you have 15 minutes? I said, mm -hmm. yeah, I got 15 minutes. He said, well, you got time to paint. Mm -hmm. And I literally started painting 15 mm -hmm. minutes a day, a day. And this was 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. I have a show coming up in Amherst, Massachusetts mm -hmm. in April at the University of Massachusetts for one month, an art solo art show. And that's applying the 15 minutes a day. But also, I have a sign on my bulletin board saying that I am a composer. So I compose every day. And in, term, in terms of having discipline to do it, and then you, get, you find yourself, you go over, you know, you go from one hump to the next hump, mm -hmm. and then the next level, and you make it to the next level. But you, you just have to just keep cultivating what you have naturally with practice and performance. Yeah, it sounds like the second part is that you have the confidence to say, hey, you need to see this. I did this. I want you to see this. Because <laughs> I write every day, but I don't know that I've gotten to the point of going, hey, you need to see this. <laughs> So there's something where you feel sure of what you're doing. Oh, of course. I mean, you know, you travel this path one time, maybe, so you might as well let it all hang out. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very question. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm done. Like, is there something in place where, you know, the great ones like yourselves um, are mentoring young people? Um, so that what it is you have is continuing you know, to be passed down through them, you know, and they're sitting at the feet of, you know. Oh, definitely. I, Lord has students. You know, you have students. You have a lot of students. And, uh, and from time to time, I have students. And one of my students is here tonight. I don't have a lot of students, but I think we're always passing on what we do to, to the younger musicians. And uh, it is a continuum. Do you think that, when I think about the ACM and the fact that the free school's been going on for like 45 years, and I look at someone like Nicole Mitchell or David Boykins, or the, like the people that have come out of the Chicago scene, and then I think about that, and like I don't know that New York has anything like that, right, or anywhere has had a, a free school for musicians that have been taught by the elder musicians, right, mm -hmm. since the 60s. and. Yeah, there is one relatively new organization called Music is Our First Language that a, a brother named Ray Archie has started on his Brooklyn base. So you should check that out. I didn't, I didn't know I was coming here, so I didn't bring more detailed information. But they're doing just that, enlisting veteran musicians to teach young people and that kind of thing. But Music is Our First Language. Because, yeah, I, I mean, I think. When people think about the ACM and all this great stuff that comes out of there, right? Like, I think that that school, you know, that's like the least mm -hmm. focused on piece. That like wave after wave of talent, you know, like mm -hmm. I just wonder. Like, 
Well, that's the one I thing mean, that I, I regret about the black artist group, the fact that we didn't leave a set of core musicians there to continue mm -hmm. what we did before we moved to Paris. In the location. In that same, in the, in the location. But when the, when the group broke up, it just kind of just pulled apart. But when musicians in the ACM, when, they, when a bunch of them moved to New York, they kept a younger group in Chicago and kept the organization going. And that was very important. It was something that the black artist group did not do. But I mean, we've, we've been, over the years, we've gone back and forth to St. Louis and had students there and had communi kept communication open, but it wasn't in a, any kind of form. I just, I, <laughs> why is it one, it's so like that little sad thing. I mean, you were in one year, you had a building. I'm like 19 years, <laughs> I don't have a space. You know, I don't know. We were and incredibly lucky. If you have lucky. a sp space, is like key. Mm -hmm. It's key. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be a pain in the neck, but the space is also an incredible pain in the neck. Uh, you know, for the person who has to run it and fund it and keep it functioning. But uh, without a space, you can't do so many things. I mean, you can't. It's like where do you where do you teach? Yeah, it's like. You know, one thing I think we have to go back to to using, you know, political clout. You know, being more active, being activist to claim some of these spaces is, is like the reason I know your music. I know your music is from the Atlanta Free Jazz Festival and the National Black Arts Center that was in Atlanta that took over a public school that had been abandoned. You know, we we do have to like become more energized and discipline ourselves to put pressure on what it is that we need and we want out of local government. Right. You know, I mean, New York, you know, the real estate here was crazy. But unless we begin to put the pressure, you know, on uh, the government that we pay taxes for to use some of this abandoned space, it won't happen. Right. But I mean, uh, we eventually lost that space because they lost the funding because they felt that we were, had gotten too political. <laughs> so, so we did have funding for about three years, two, two and a half, three years. And that last year, it, was, it wasn't, it didn't resume and because we, they thought that we were too political. That was the theater department. Just to touch on that, I, I didn't want to ask this question because I didn't want to be controversial, but I know from like <laughs> Phil Caron in Chicago and from the, the, the Watts Writers Group, the CIA actually got involved in subverting these types of groups and creating eternal dissension. And just you mentioning that sort of challenge you faced internally from government organizations. Is that something you experienced yourself? We were all we always thought that the black artist group had been infiltrated, but we never found out who it was, mm -hmm. who, what it was. But I think we, there were some people because we kept our meetings open. Mm -hmm. When I came to New York one summer and went to the East, it was a, a group, it, a place in Brooklyn called the East, and they demanded that it was a segregated uh, performance space. There were no white people permitted in the East to hear the music. And so when I went back to St. Louis and started talking about having, getting a building and finding, starting our own group, that question came up and we decided that we would be an open, have the audience open. We wouldn't close it off, but that, that kind of energy that did happen, those kind of incidents did happen back at that particular time when that happened. I mean, when, when the East was a viable and when we were starting the Black Artist Group. In the late 60s. Any other questions? Please yes. come back and speak again. <laughs> yes, sir. I'd like to hear something. I don't have any question, but I'd like to hear something from the guru or whether this conversation with you have something to say. I'd like to hear because. Waiting what he's going to say. <laughs> I, don't have any, I don't have any question. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I just did what I did without thinking about doing it, just do it. 
and kind of did it that way. And I always had my mind sort of made up like that, figuring out, you know, what to do. But uh, I didn't have any, like, really, what you call long-range plans. Mm -hmm. But I did, without realizing it. But the best I could say, you know, just, <clears throat> my mind was always sitting somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's kind of strange. I have to think about that. Maybe the next time we have a meeting, then I'll talk more. <laughs> then it'll make a little bit more sense. Because actually, I just came out to the hospital, and I'm trying to deal with this, you know, and other stuff. It's, it's interesting to be in a conversation or listen to a conversation that goes all the way back to, uh, what are you going back to? What year? 1968. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going back to 1968. Wow. I mean, because during the time we did that, no, thinking this far ahead, this is, what, 2014? Yeah, wow. <laughs> I wasn't even thought of it for <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> a lot of stuff wasn't thought about. I mean, during that time, we were just doing what we did. So, and to think that, like, it's 2014 now, on its way, you know, to somebody else, it's like incredible. It's amazing. So, actually, to still even be here mm -hmm. at all, you know, mm -hmm. and to uh, <clears throat> well, at the time we were just trying to do what we were gonna do day by day. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's about far as it was. You know, in terms of thinking that many years ahead of time, no, mm -hmm. uh -uh, not at all. So now I'm to listen to everybody talk going down. <laughs> but you have a real clear idea of what you do. Yeah. And it's like you can really hear it. So it's not just like, you know, you may be not being all verbal about it, but it's like I can, I'm, I am very aware of how clear your concept is in your music and what you're trying to do. I don't know if I can, I can't verbalize it either, but it's well, your music is not mine. But. I hear it. Yeah, but the, you don't think around. No, because <laughs> I just I was kind of clear about what I wanted to do all along, without having to go through a whole lot of stuff to get to it. You know, it wasn't right. complicated. I saw this instrument, and fell in love with it. Like, wow, what's that? <laughs> I'm about now, no, nine years old, ten years old, horn, big horn, about the same size. So <laughs> I'm looking going, like, damn, what is that? <laughs> and so they said, it says baritone saxophone. Told me one time. That's it. That was kind of it. So, you know, I fell in love with something, you know, immediately. That was on my quest. Mm -hmm. That quick. So, you know, it's kind of, it was strange. So we all ran into each other at the same time. Bam! It was like that. We didn't. It's kind of weird, in a way. In one kind of way. Another kind of way is not. It's kind of strange how everything happened. Be how it is right now. After all that time, that you know, be this part down the line, really, it's like, it's amazing to really be truthful. Absolutely amazing. It's about the best way I can put it. You know, any other kind of way I put it, I'm going to have to make up some stuff. So, thinking about the continuum that you mentioned, it yes, start with right spirituals and both go back to Africa, spiritual, blues, jazz, free jazz, rap, gangster rap, all of that. One thing in common is that it's music of an oppressed people. And, and so our, it, could you speak about the relationship between self-determination and artistic expression? Because I, it seems to me that there's some kind of correlation there. This was one of the outlets that an oppressed people had and the artistic expression um, was one domain where there was a degree of self-determination that made it unique and made it what it is throughout the continuum. Would you agree with that or? Uh, no, that's all true. It really is. I mean, uh, without even trying to think about it, I mean, it's, it's sort of strange in one kind of way because I, I already was at the end before I started. Which is kind of strange, you know. I'm just sitting there listening to him talk about it as he talked the way he talked. I'm sitting down, wait a minute. 
but it goes all the way back, and, and it's almost like we were here when we started. <laughs> it's just kind of, it really is kind of strange, though. So, <clears throat> but it's different. It really, really is different. So somebody else needs to write another book, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> figure out, you know, what that should be about. It's just, it is amazing, though. And it's weird how it did, had all hung together, didn't hang together, did what it had to do, did what it did what it had to do, and just kept rolling. And we rolled with it some kind of way. We just kept rolling. It's, it's really different, it really is. Someone else could probably write a better book about it than I could. Maybe. <laughs> well, let's have a round of applause. Make a donation as you go out yeah. for our charge. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>